These days, you can find plenty of videos of people improving logos, websites, even lawns. But when was the last time you saw a video of someone improving some code? Well, for this video, my friend Monocode has given me permission to tear his code apart. So that's exactly what we're going to be doing. So, if you want to learn something about coding, or you just want to see some satisfying code transformation, stick around, because you're in for a treat. After opening the project in Godot, the first thing I had to do was to run it. So, oh, ooh, okay, we can control this thing. We've got asteroids coming on screen. We've got sacrilegious diagonal pixels. And presumably there's a way, ah, uh, yes, I can shoot. Yeah, honestly, a very neat little oh, asteroids clone right here. It controls well, it feels very fast. I like, I like the speed of it. It's simple, but it's fun. Godot uses a Python-like language called GDScript, and I decided to start by opening the player script. And the very first thing I've noticed is that none of these variables have types. You don't have to define the types of your variables in GDScript, but in my opinion, it's much better to be explicit as this can help prevent accidental errors. And the easiest way to do that is literally just by using this colon equals operator instead of a regular equals. And what that says to Godot is this variable has a value of 10, but it also has the same type as this. So in this case, it's an integer. Uh, in this case, it's a float. This is equivalent to writing this. So that's a quick win right there. We can just define all the types. See, right now I have no idea what type duh is. Um, I can see it's being assigned an int. So we will call that an int. Another quick win is prefixing function and variable names with an underscore to denote them as private. This is just a convention that tells developers that these things shouldn't be accessed from outside of the class that they're in. And just to double check these things aren't needed elsewhere, we can use Control shift f to search the entire project. I'm gonna do Control r for replace, and we're gonna replace rotation velocity with underscore rotation velocity. Oh, okay, that's problematic. We're gonna match case on that. Next, I made a few other minor changes like removing trailing white space and unneeded brackets. Normally, I would get an auto formatter to do this sort of thing for me, but I don't actually know if there's one available for Godot. I noticed there was this method with a bit of a strange name on area2d area entered. And it's not used directly in code, but it is hooked up to a signal of one of the player's colliders. So when anything enters the colored area, that's when this method is gonna be called. So I decided to just rename this on area 2D entered. But going back to the code, what I wanted to say was there's all this nesting going on here, which can be avoided by just inverting this condition and introducing an early return statement. And this is something I always try and do whenever I can, because the more nested your code becomes, the harder it is to manage and maintain. The same is obviously going on here in this input method, but I probably wouldn't turn this into an early return because it's quite common in these input methods to have lots of different if, else if, else if statements. So I'll keep this as is, but if we really wanted to like keep things tidy, we could actually extract all of this to a function. Let's call it shoot because that's what it's doing. And then we'll call that function from inside the input method. And you can see that's already just a lot clearer what's going on there. Underscore shoot. I'm noticing as well that we're actually listening to the UI accept action. This is a built in action, which as the name would suggest is intended to be used when you're uh, clicking on a button or something like that in the UI. So, we can actually define our own action instead in project settings. If we go to input map, hide the built-in actions, you can see we don't actually have any actions of our own defined, apart from this none action. I'm not sure exactly what that's about. We're gonna just delete that and create a new one. Let's call this shoot. It's good practice to define custom actions for all the inputs in your game. This makes our intent much more explicit, and it also means that each action could be potentially rebound to a different key. So instead of UI accept here, we'll now say was action pressed shoot. And this is now very, very intuitive. If you've pressed the shoot action, then you shoot. And we can now reduce this indentation as well. Bullet node dot instantiate. What is bullet node? That is a scene which we're preloading. This is our bullet scene. 
It's basically just a small square sprite and a collider around it. But our bullet node at the top has a script associated with it. And that script is bullet.gd. So what that allows us to do is inside bullet.gd, we can actually give it a named type. We can say this is a bullet. Whatever has this script is now a bullet. So in the player script, when we instantiate our bullet node, we can actually assign a type to that. In other words, our compiler now knows that this variable is a bullet, which is the type defined by this other script. Now I can see that we are offsetting the bullet slightly based on the player's rotation so that it spawns in front of the player. And at the moment we're calculating this vector manually, but I wonder if there's actually a built-in way to calculate a vector from an angle. I suspect that there is. Vector2.from angle rotation. So this nasty maths can just be replaced with a built-in function. At this point, I realized that I'd broken something. Yeah, I can no longer turn. So I turned my attention to the input handling, which was a little bit strange. We're using a custom function called process inputs to handle both the rotation and acceleration. But again, we're relying on these built-in UI inputs instead of bespoke actions. So the first thing I did was create dedicated actions for this purpose. So now we can say right, left, forward, backward. The process inputs function was taking two inputs and figuring out a value based on which of those was pressed. However, Godot has a built-in function called getAxis for this exact purpose. So let's call that instead. And we'll pass that directly into the function instead of the action names as we were doing before. Process inputs was a bit of a confusing method. So I started by adding types to the parameters, renaming some of the parameters based on what they're actually being used for. We could now remove the dir variable altogether and finally simplifying some of the logic inside the method. Okay, we're back in business. Another minor thing here, we have a reference here to this animated sprite, and we're referring to that by name using this uh, dollar sign, which is equivalent to writing get node like this. But let's say we were to move this animated sprite at some point later down the line. Let's say this became a child of another node like that. This would then break because the path to find this node has now changed. To avoid that, I always like to press axis as unique name. And that basically assigns a unique name to this animated sprite 2D. So we can refer to it like so. And that means wherever this node moves within the player's scene tree, we'll still be able to retrieve it. And I'm noticing again, we should probably assign a type to this so that the compiler actually knows the type of this variable. All right, this is looking pretty good, but there's just one final thing I want to address. And that is this line here. GetParent.getNode assumes that this particle manager exists underneath the parent node. In other words, it expects it to be a sibling of the player. In Godot, that's not really considered a safe assumption because although you can know precisely what's below you in the scene graph, you can't really make any guarantees about what's above you because that just depends how the parent node is configured. Now, of course, this works with the current setup, but if we wanted to make it safer, there's a few approaches we could take. We could make the particle manager into a singleton. We could emit a signal and have the particle manager connect to it somehow. But I think the easiest fix in this case is gonna to be to use a group. So instead of getParent.getNode, we'll be using getTree.getFirstNode in group and we'll just register the particle manager node with that group. So inside the game scene, this is where the particle manager node is defined. We'll go to the node tab on the right and we'll add it to the group. I'm gonna leave it there for now, but here's a final side-by-side -side comparison of the code before and after. And if you enjoyed this and you wanna see more videos like this, let me know in the comments. See you next time. Thank you.